When I was in seminary, when I was in seminary, the spiritual director gave a piece of advice that stuck with me for a long time. He said, lads, there's a lot theology can teach you, but it can never take the place of good literature. In classic novels, in stories that have perdured for centuries, therein lies truths about the divine and the human that are more aptly communicated through literature than even through precise, systematic, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, English definitions. We're about to enter into one of those truths. If you saw the remake of Les Miserables, or Les Mis for short, have whatever opinion you want of the singing, acting, whatever. There's a character, a mother, whose name is Fantine. And in, existing in France at a time of great famine and need of the majority of the population, the people do desperate things to feed themselves and their family. This mother, Fantine, sells her hair, sells her teeth, sells her body to care for her child, Cosette, at an orphanage. And there's a very beautiful depiction of her at the end of the film, after she's passed away. And at the end of the film, she comes back to Earth to greet the main character, Javert, or Jean Valjean, rather, and to usher his soul into eternity after many acts of generosity and courage. And the way that she comes back is extraordinarily interesting because she comes back in her glorified body with a shaved head, without her beautiful hair that she sacrificed. And I remember the first time I watched this, and I was like, whoa, these people don't know the resurrection. One of many reasons I no longer work out is I say, whatever, I'm going to get a better body in the resurrection anyways. <laughs> so I'll just let it ride now. But then, that notion stayed with me. And I began to read many accounts of the different saints to whom Jesus appeared at certain parts of their life. And if you know any of these saints, Satan himself can appear like Jesus. Whatever Jesus looks like in an apparition. Maybe the wavy hair Malibu Jesus thing. I don't know. But I do know this. It is recorded and affirmed by the church that Satan can appear in a convincing way like Jesus, but he will never be presented as humble, and he will never have the wounds on his glorified body if it's Satan pretending to be like Jesus in a vision. Because the wounds in Jesus' body, which remain after the resurrection, are signs of God's eternal love of us. And after Jesus resurrects from the body in the glorified fashion, super omnipotent, walking through walls, whatever you want, you'd think the guy could have gotten a little neosporin and fixed up his hands. But he chose to let the wounds of his crucifixion remain, presumably unto eternity, as a proclamation of his undeniable love for us unto death. So too, this new film, Les Mis, 
has one of the characters come back and a depiction of her own glorified body showcases the sacrifices that she made on this earth for the welfare of her daughter Cosette. I think you and I have our vision of what we're going to look like, how big our muscles are going to be in heaven. And I think how we will look will be very different than even how we want to look. Because you and I think of a glorified body and we say, no errors, no blemishes, nothing that looks unsavory. GQ and Revlon cover page right here. But remember, God's ways are different than our ways. Today is the feast of Corpus Christi. It's actually the patronal feast of my new parish. So especially at the elevation of the most precious blood, please pray for them. They don't know what they're in for. (laughs) But we have this feast to underline the love of God in the giving over of his body. He who first gave his body over in form of bread and wine, the Eucharist, then the next day gave it over in the crucifixion. We in every faithful Catholic Church have both the cross and the Eucharist very close to each other. He who said, take this, all of you, and eat of it, this is my body. I actually had spent three hours doing a Greek lesson with you, and I decided to scrap it because sometimes this mass gets a little sleepy. But this, take this, all of you, and eat of it, is a direct, non-symbolic statement. There's many ways of being fluffy in Greek. The way in which the scriptures were recorded were anything but. That we who believe that what right now sits over there as bread and wine becomes the presence of God in the Eucharist, as he promised, Foreshadowed in John 6, given over in three of the four Gospels and one of the letters of St. Paul. Biblical proof for the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. We get to this one part. There are four Eucharistic prayers. Each of them have their own advantages and their own focuses. Today I'll be using Eucharistic prayer number three. And there's something really beautiful about this one. We talk about, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. In everything else in our life, what we eat becomes a part of us. I eat carrot, I absorb beta carotene, it goes to my eyes or wherever else, it does its thing in me. The Eucharist is the singular food where it works exactly the opposite. I eat the body of Christ and it does not become me. I become it. I become part of God's mystical body. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. And then it says this. May he make of us an eternal offering to you. Before the translation, the retranslation that's more faithful to the original Latin in 2011, it used to say, may he make us an everlasting gift to you. And I used to get goosebumps at that. Young children have dreams, have daydreams, have ideas of living forever. When you fight Power Rangers with each other, you want your Power Ranger to be able to vanquish everything else and live forever. We have a human aspiration to live forever. But it's only Christianity that recognizes that, yes, it's possible, and mysteriously it involves death as well. Go back to the Old Testament, our first reading today. 
the blood of lambs was put over the lentils of the houses of the Israelites so that the angel of death would pass over, so that they would not be subject to the curses that the Lord was allowing obstinate Egypt to experience. Would that they had only repented and the Lord would have shown mercy. But extricating his beloved people from slavery, leading them into freedom, forming them as a new nation, a people after the heart of God, the Lord liberates them by blood. A foreshadowing of the blood that would be poured out from the cross by the hands, feet, side, and head of Jesus. But then Hebrews, our second reading, says we no longer have need to offer sacrifice daily. Remember, once the old temple was set up, they offered three, four, five times a day the blood of goats, turtle doves, bulls, so they would realize in their persons that the wages of sin is death. But they were able to transfer the culpability of sin to animals and let them be slaughtered. That's part of the ritual, liturgical sacrifice, that then Jesus takes upon himself and ends once and for all, instituting a new and bloodless sacrifice, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And he commands, do this in memory of me. So we who are drawn together, unified by the body and blood of Jesus, who are strengthened, who are nourished by it, we are made into an everlasting gift, an eternal offering of love to God the Father. You and I don't think enough about eternity. There's a funny restaurant in the People's Republic of Boulder on West Pearl Street. It's called the Yellow Deli. And the Yellow Deli is from this kind of religious group, cult, something. They have wonderful sandwiches, horrible theology. And I remember going in there the first time, and, and there's all kinds of psychedelic things painted on the wall. But there's this one phrase, this big uh, sentence, that goes about the entirety of the restaurant. And it says something to the effect of this. If you imagine a sparrow flying to the nearest beach, picking up a single grain of sand, and flying to the farthest quasar of the universe. So, by the way, the universe is 14 parsecs big. Okay, a parsec is 46 billion light years across. That's just the radius, not the diameter, of the ever-growing expansion of the universe. Remember, light takes uh, one second to go seven times around the circumference of the Earth. A light year is a long ways off. A billion light years is a long, long ways off. These Boulderite hippies might say, far out, dude. Imagine this pharaoh picking up this grain of sand and taking it to the farthest quasar, whatever that is, on the edge of the universe and then flying back at a sparrow's pace. Coming back and grabbing a second grain of sand then once all of the grains of sand have been transferred to that farthest quasar, eternity has just begun. Leave it to the Boulderites to give you a trippy moment. <laughs> and so what we do in this flesh, what we do in this life, redounds to the glory of God and to that of ourselves. Not because we're great, but because Jesus loves us. 
We pray in this and in every Mass, something to the effect of, may he make of us an eternal offering to you, an everlasting gift of love purchased from sin and death by the wages of the blood of Jesus, shed miraculously for love of us. We are among the fewest of Christian religions that still holds fast to transubstantiation. That Jesus meant what he said when he said, take this, this is my body, this is my blood. There are a large contingency of Catholics that think it's a wonderful symbol, a lovely fairy tale. But there's a Southern author who said, if the whole thing is a fairy tale, to hell with it. It is not worth giving up Sundays or sacrificing things in my life for a fairy tale. The love of God in the Eucharist is profound, is beautiful, is eternal, and it will draw us into the kingdom of his everlasting, eternal, never-ceasing love for us where we will be perfectly content with him. This is precisely the good news that we are invigorated by the Eucharist to go out and to proclaim to others, to those, as the Father of John the Baptist says, who dwell in darkness in the shadow of death, so that the Lord may guide our feet into the way of his peace. This is the reason you are here, on this sleepy Sunday afternoon. Praised be Jesus Christ.